Welcome to the Blessed Carlo Acutis Project teaching videos. In this teaching video, we are delighted to welcome Sister Mary and Sister Rachel of the Servant Sisters. And in this video, we will also be looking at married life and vocation and, uh, of course, family life. So, uh, sisters, you are very welcome and we are delighted to have you with us this week. Thanks, Eileen. So as always, uh, we would like to start with a prayer. So maybe you would like to lead us in a short prayer before we begin. Right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We ask the Holy Spirit to be with us, to fill our minds and our hearts, to help us understand the teachings of the church about marriage, family life, and also consecrated life. We ask especially that the Blessed Mother be with us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Lord, pray for us sinners, 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 now and at the hour Lord, of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lovely. So, sisters, our first question uh, for this video is, why do you think God called people to consecrate a life in the church? Good. Okay, great question. <laughs> well, first of all, consecrated life is a vocation. So there's many different vocations within the church, and consecrated life would just be one of the vocations that is within the church. Um, with every vocation, of course, it's a matter of discovering what God has made you for. Um, really, every vocation has to do with your purpose, your purpose in life, and the purpose of everyone's life ultimately is to love, to learn how to love. So consecrated life is just another way of expressing how a person can love and that God has called that person particularly to a consecration to him, completely to him. Um, some are called to imitate our Lord through profession of vows. So consecrated life has to do with taking vows. Evangelical councils is another name for them. And that includes poverty, a chastity, and obedience. Um, for our world, those vows can be something that's very hard to understand. Um, but they're beautiful because it's the way of life that our Lord has chosen to live in a radical way. And that he calls particular souls to imitate him in in living out those vows. Um, another aspect of consecrated life includes a uh, community life. So uh, most religious um, consecrated, they live in families or communities uh, where they're able to live out a particular charism, which is a gift from the Holy Spirit, a particular way of living out their religious vocation. Mm -hmm. um, so poverty, obedience, and chastity, those would be the evangelical counsels um, that consecrated live out. And then there's that community life aspect. So. Beautiful. Very nice. Thank you so much, sisters. And of course, uh, yourselves are a lovely example of uh, that exact vocation and uh, community <laughs> life, of course. <laughs> So our second question now is uh, looking at marriage. And uh, the question, I suppose, really is what is the significance of marriage in society? And why is marriage held to be so important in the Christian faith? Right. Um, marriage and family life is so essential because, um, as we know, the basic unit of society is the family. Uh, family is fundamental to society. And um, without it, of course, there's no children, there's no people for the building up of society. So marriage and family life is the ideal place for, um, for human people to be born and to grow and to contribute to society, of course. Um, for the Christian faith, um, family life, marriage and family life was given to us by God after he created uh, the, first, uh, the first human person. Um, he instituted marriage. Um, and we find that in, in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2 in particular, uh, where we see how God created man, male and female. Um, and the first thing that he asked of the first two people was that they be fruitful and that they multiply, that they fill the earth and subdue it. Um, so marriage is fundamental. It's been fundamental since the beginning of, of creation. Um, it's also important because marriage uh, is a commitment between Two people, a man and a woman, um, and that 
that commitment between a man and a woman, it makes sure that children have a home, they have a family uh, to grow up in, a secure place where they can uh, be nourished and educated. Um, and so it's fundamental for society that there is that basis, um, that children have that kind of pro protective uh, surroundings and, and an environment where they can grow up and be uh, loved and also they can truly develop into who they were meant to be mm -hmm. and in that way really truly contribute to society so. mm -hmm. and in a good way too and uh, just to keep in mind that family life is the place where saints are produced so mm -hmm. for the church that's a great richness as well mm -hmm. that that's where saints come from they come from marriage and family mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Yeah. And as you were saying that, I suppose, bless Carlo is uh, an example, though his family life might have been different and he was especially graced with faith. But uh, of course, he he was part of a family. So and maybe drawing his own family into a deeper faith as well as a child. So. <laughs> Uh, so our next question uh, relates to the importance of chastity. Um, so, for example, for a boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, why should they wait until marriage before being intimate? Yeah, this is a tough question, I suppose. A lot of young people maybe ask this question. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to understand that uh, human love it works through stages. Um, so when a person is preparing for marriage, the first stage that they go through, of course, is friendship with a person. There's friendship, and then that friendship becomes exclusive. There's a process of dating, or traditionally, maybe we call that courtship, um, which is meant to discern marriage. Um, so there are those stages of human love, which is important for a young person to remember because uh, as you're preparing for marriage, you have to remember that it's not a game. It's not something to, to do just for fun. It actually has a purpose. It has a very important purpose, mm -hmm. um, which is a chance for you to discern marriage and um, to discover if the person that, that you love, that you're dating, if that's supposed to be your spouse. Um, so there's an important aspect of dating that doesn't need to be rushed. Um, it's a chance for young people when they are dating to to show their nobility, their generosity, sincerity, and the way that they treat the other person. Um, it's, a, it's a way for them to show strength of will as well. You know, if you're able to respect the other person, respect their bodies and their souls, um, then that time of dating becomes a very fruitful and special time. Um, so dating has a purpose. Um, like I said, it's to discern marriage. And so marriage then, it, the essence of marriage requires a commitment um, of authentic love. So young people too, they should remember that there is a purpose to marriage. There, there are two purposes um, ultimately to marriage. Um, that could probably be summed up in two words, love and life. Mm -hmm. And the first purpose of marriage is mutual love. So there's the union of the spouses. And there's a big word that we use for that. That's called an uh, indissolubility which just means an unbroken bond. Um, that's the first purpose of marriage, that there is that union between the spouses. Um, and that is for three reasons, really. Um, first of all, because of the essence of love. Um, love is meant to be mutual, self-giving, um, without reservation. So that requires a total gift to the other person. Um, it's also an image of God's unconditional love for creation. So God shows us, first of all, the way that his love is, and that's the way that we should be imitating his love. And then it also represents Christ's love for the church. Um, so that's all in that first purpose of marriage. Um, the second thing that young people should remember, too, is that the second purpose of marriage is procreation, um, which through the gift of their bodies, the spouses give themselves. Uh, each one gives himself to the other person. Um, and that's for the purpose of bearing and bringing up children in a loving family. Um, so that purpose of marriage requires openness to life. So that's why it's so important that young people wait until marriage um, to be able to have relation that those uh, marital relations because the purpose of dating and marriage um, is supposed to be for that gift of the self. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Mary, for that explanation. 
Uh, so now our next question is uh, going to celibacy. Uh, so some people might consider celibacy maybe to be unnatural. Uh, so why is there a rule of celibacy for priests, nuns and monks? Yeah, that's a, another good question. <laughs> uh, that probably a lot of young people are wondering. I've actually run into quite a few young people that have asked me about uh, celibacy. So Perhaps the first important thing to understand about celibacy, which is related to chastity as well, um, is that it can be hard to understand when a person doesn't have faith. Um, but with faith, uh, we can see that actually celibacy is something very, very beautiful. Why? Because it's our Lord asks certain people to live a life of celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Um, it's also a way of showing that we can be totally dedicated uh, with undivided hearts to God and to the service of others. So celibacy allows you to be uh, living your vocation in such a way that your heart um, isn't committed to a family and to children, but is free to be able to serve others uh, without any, um, any of those kind of restrictions, which you might, you might see it that way. Um, and then of course, um, it's meant to signify and to proclaim in the church the glory of the world to come. So actually a life of celibacy, of, of virginity, is a sign of what each person is going to be living in heaven. So we're a sign um, that's proclaiming what is the future of each person um, when life here on earth is over. Um, so I think um, really it's also important to remember that celibacy, um, it's a gift, first of all. And sometimes we don't see it as a gift. Maybe even priests and religious can find it hard to see it as a gift. Um, but to have a vocation to a life of celibacy is not, um, your vocation as a priest or as a religious is not just a job office. It's a state of life. Mm -hmm. um, and Jesus Christ, who is priest, um, he was a priest with his whole being, with his body and his soul. Um, so it's not so much doing, but it's about being, being who you are. Um, and as I said before, it also allows a priest or a religious to be completely free to serve the church and its needs. Um, so more than a rule or a restriction, really, it's another way of living out uh, our sexuality as God intended it. It's freedom um, so that we can live for God and for others with an undivided heart. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks so much for that. And I suppose like as you were speaking there, you know, a celibate life is still a life that's filled with so much love in giving to others. And of course, the love we receive from God, um, you know, throughout our lives, of course, that runs into all vocations, you know, and that there are different uh, ways of expressing that love as well. So uh, our next question brings in both vocations. Uh, so are there, <laughs> uh, are there any similarities between the vocation to marriage and the vocation to religious life? Very simply, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, all of the vocations, if we see it first in maybe a negative light, um, both vocations imply a renouncement and uh, serve it as uh, sacrifice, sorry, renouncement and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what your vocation is, whether it be marriage or religious life, there's always gonna be a part of giving up something. I mean, if you think uh, marriage, uh, there's a part where for a woman, for example, for her to get married to a man, she has to renounce all other men. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a simple thing, but it's true. There's a, there's a renouncement there. There's also sacrifice that's implied because when you are married and you have a family, of course, you're going to have to sacrifice time. You're going to have to sacrifice money. You're going to have to sacrifice many things to be able to provide for your husband, your wife, your children. Um, so both vocations, um, that would be for marriage, you know, like the, that aspect of renouncement and sacrifice. And for religious, the renouncement and sacrifice is different. Um, there's a renouncement of having a husband or a wife and, and children you know, your own family. Um, and there's, of course, many sacrifices that come when God calls you to religious life. So there's similarities there. No matter what your vocation is, there is that negative aspect, if you'd like to see it that way. But then, of course, both vocations, um, there's a call to love and to service. Um, both of them, the key 
to both vocations is the gift of self. They both have that aspect uh, to them, that we are created by God out of love and we're created for love. So we have to choose to love. Um, and that, that word love, unfortunately, it's very much misused. Um, and the gift of self is something that we don't understand. Instead of living a selfless life, we tend to want to live a selfish life. And what we have to be striving for is to give of our hearts, give of our souls, give of ourselves completely to the other, whether that be God or be to my spouse and my children. Um, so it's important to remember in both vocations that love is more than just a feeling, an emotion, a passion. It's an act of the will. It's saying to the other, I love you and I am willing to die for you. I want to give my life to you. Um, and both of those vocations as well, they have a shared uh, characteristics of love, in particular, uh, spousal love. So with both vocations, the way that we live out love has to be, first of all, total. So that means with my feelings, my affections, my emotions, my will, my intellect, I have to discover the value of the other person, I'm loving the whole person, body and soul. So it has to be total. Um, it's also exclusive, so it's spousal. That means it's beyond a mere friendship with a person in marriage. My love has to be spousal. If I'm called to consecrated life, then I take Jesus Christ, or for a priest, he takes the church as his spouse. So it has that aspect of, of, of spousal love. And it also has to be faithful. It has to be faithful to that surrender, that entire gift of yourself to the other person. And it's also a love that is forever. So that's the demand of love, really, that it not just be something that lasts five minutes, or I say, I love you for a week, or <laughs> for a year, it's forever. You know, in, in marriage, you say, and when you take marriage vows, the couple says, till death do us part. That's until I die, I'm with you. For religious, a little bit different. You're almost saying, you know, till death unites us. Mm -hmm. It's a nice thing as well, but that means that love is forever. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the love that both vocations have to share is that it be fruitful because that's part of the characteristic of love is that it give life. Uh, that's a natural consequence of love. In a marriage, that love that gives life comes in the bearing of children, of having children. If that's, you know, God gifts the, the spouses that gift, which is children. And then in religious life and consecrated life, there is uh, bearing fruit in the life of souls. So for priests, it's giving life to souls. Uh, for religious sisters, too, we give life as spiritual mothers of souls. Uh, we give ourselves over to, to the souls in that way. We take them on as our children. Mm -hmm. um, so both of those vocations have to live out that aspect of love, which is a gift of the self, but through those different characteristics of so being total, exclusive, faithful, forever, and fruitful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's brilliant. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I think uh, it, it's a question that could fill out an episode on its own, really. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, no, it's, it's lovely. It's just drawing all those similarities and uh, the way you shared and explained that as well. So thank you very much. So our next question is, I suppose, about the the way the Catholic Church uh, communicates on romance and relationships. So sometimes I suppose people can think maybe the church's understanding or views may seem old fashioned. Um, and yet maybe when young people are watching movies and television, they see a much more open morality um, and the way in which people use their bodies. So what advice would you give to young people uh, watching um, or what advice would you give to young people about watching TV and movies? Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, suppose it's really important for young people to have in mind a, a very important principle. Um, and that is the fact that we are body and soul. Um, this is a very different idea than just thinking that I, that I have a body. That my body is just something that I can do whatever I want with. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty typical to hear nowadays, I can do what I want with my body and similar expressions like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important for, for a young person to remember that their body is not their property, it's who they are. Um, 
I often like to use this in, in my classes when the young people just think like if you went into, you know, the bank or to a shop and somebody went up to you and held a gun up to your head and said, I'm going to shoot your body. <laughs> You'd think they're ridiculous because they're not shooting your body. You would say, you're not going to shoot my body. You're shooting me. Why? Because it's you. Your body is you. Your soul is you. So that's an important principle for young people to know that I am body and soul. And part of that means that since I, since I am body, that I have senses. So I have eyes to see, I have ears to hear. And whatever enters through my eyes, whatever enters through my ears, in a way it gets recorded inside of me. My senses God has given me so that, you know, I can learn about things, I can see things, I can develop and experience things. But the things that I experience through my senses, they get recorded in me. And we're not computers, you know. Um, and when a computer gets really full of lots of information, you can normally have the option to reformat a computer and start over again. But with us as people, as human beings, we can't get reformatted. Whatever we see, whatever we hear, all of those things, they get recorded inside of me and they stay with me forever. So it's important for us, and especially for young people to reflect on the kind of TV they watch, the movies they go to see, the films they see, the music that they listen to, because all of that affects me interiorly. It gets recorded inside of me. And whatever I have in my interior, whatever is inside of me, I'm going to express it through my body. Mm -hmm. um, so what advice would I give? Think, mm -hmm. reflect about what you see, about what you hear, and remember that it gets recorded inside of you. And you can't reformat yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to ask yourself, what kind of person do you want to be? Because all of the things that you see that enter through your body, through your senses, they start to shape who you are. So if you want to be um, a generous person, a kind person, a chaste, loving, uh, you know, um, a strong person, then you have to be careful about what is coming inside of you because that's going to shape mm -hmm. and form who you are. Mm -hmm. So be deep, think deeply. You know? mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a very good question because, you know, so sometimes people can think, well, what I'm watching doesn't really affect me or, you know, that's on the screen and the people are different. And, uh, you know, so there's so many ways uh, of justifying, but, uh, you know, like the analogies you used are even when we consider what we eat, you know, we, this idea of clean eating and being on a good diet and how we understand that affects our body. It's, uh, it's, it makes sense that it's no different with our soul that what we see and watch is so important if we want to have a, I suppose, a flourishing uh, soul and uh, to flourish, please God and virtue with God's grace as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now our next question uh, relates to pro-life. Uh, so, of course, um, <laughs> uh, we have another big question <laughs> for you now, sisters. Uh, so uh, as we know, um, at one point, the majority of people in Ireland uh, thought that abortion was always wrong. And of course, now we see uh, more and more people think abortion can be permissible in some cases. Uh, so, of course, in schools, uh, students, and particularly in secondary school, of course, uh, you know, they may find their pro-life positions challenged. Uh, so what advice would you give to a teenager who finds uh, that their Catholic faith may be at odds with the views of their peers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, first of all, a young, uh, you know, a young person that's in secondary school that maybe is going through that difficulty of trying to stay strong and what they know is the right thing. Um, is that they really have to be conf firmly convicted of the fact that being pro-life is the right choice. That is the right choice. Mm -hmm. um, because it means defending the most fundamental right that each human person has, which is the right to life. Mm -hmm. um, and that begins from conception, from when life begins, and that goes all the way through natural death. So advice for a young person that knows that that's the truth and that wants to live it, even though it can be hard in their environment or in their school. Uh, first of all, that they have to be brave. You have to be brave and not be afraid to be brave. Um, 
but also to know that you're not alone. I think that's probably one of the biggest um, maybe misconceptions that a young person might have is that they feel that they're very alone in being pro-life. Um, but that's just not true. Um, maybe in, in their secondary school, they, can't, they don't find that there's anybody else that thinks the same way that they do. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many young people who are pro-life. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, this generation that's living now uh, is a pro-life generation. And this can be seen in so many ways. I know I often think of um, what my experience over in the United States uh, every year, they have a big gathering in Washington, D.C., the, the March for Life, which is a huge pro-life gathering. And when you go to something like that and you see the thousands and thousands of other young people who are like-minded and know that this is the truth, that life begins at conception and that it's worth defending and fighting for, then that gives you a lot of strength, you know. So for young people, they have to be brave, first of all, because you might feel alone, but also be assured and know, have that certainty that you're not alone, that there's a whole network of other young people that think just like you do um, and are willing to fight for, for the babies, to fight for life. Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing for them to remember. We actually know one young man who, um, it, because of him he had to stand up to defend his views on pro-life and mm -hmm. in the process he lost a lot of a lot of friends a lot of his peers who didn't agree with him but after that experience and yet he met a whole new network of friends who who believe mm -hmm. the same thing that he did and um, now he just recently got married mm -hmm. um he started a, a family but he he's living a whole different life now but because he would have the courage to stand up for what he believed in. So mm. yeah. that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, so many more doors open when I suppose we allow ourselves to uh, go with God's courage into any situation and, uh, and the Holy Spirit, I suppose is very important there as well. And, uh, you know, he, he will protect us and uh, lead us towards, uh, you know, the people and friends that will help us in that support network, as you said as well. And uh, as you're speaking about the young man there, Sister Rachel, um, you know, I was just thinking of Les Carlo Kutus, of course, uh, is a brilliant example of that as well, the namesake of the project. So, <laughs> And you never know what a good example can do, do you know? Yeah. Like the same thing for Carlos Acutis has a good example. It had its, you know, its repercussions in the lives of yeah. other young people. So mm. to try to live that way <laughs> yourself, and it still does, yeah. you know, generations afterwards, yeah. you know, years afterwards. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Uh, so now, sisters, we're on to our final question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so often we hear it said that a Christian should see their body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so maybe you could share with us, what does that mean in practical terms? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, that reality, uh, the fact that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, it's a, on a practical level, it's a calling for us to practice virtue. Um, in particular, it's a calling for us to practice the virtues of chastity, modesty, and, uh, and purity. Um, what does that mean, really? Well, that, that virtue of chastity, the word itself means to be clean, to be pure, to be temperate, um, moderate in our sexuality. Um, so that means in body and spirit, knowing how to, um, to live exteriorly and interiorly as a temple of, of God, of the Holy Spirit. So for chastity, okay, if I'm trying to practice the virtue of chastity, uh, well, that involves my integrity as a person. So me as a person, I have to be whole and, and know that I'm all of me, my body and my soul belongs, first of all, to God. Um, it also has to do with the gift that I want to give of my life. So my body and my soul one day is going to be a gift. If I'm called to marriage, it's going to be a gift to my spouse. If it's a call to priesthood or to religious life, then it's a gift to God. Um, so chastity, living out chastity helps me to do that. And that first of all begins with self mastery. So that means I need to be master of myself to be able to know how to love completely. And that also means possessing myself. 
uh, what does that mean? You know, that means controlling the way that I see, the things that I hear, um, even just my gestures, everything. Um, you can't give what you don't have, right? So if my life is meant to be a gift for the other person, then I first need to be in possession of myself, my body and my soul. Um, just because of what we've spoken about before, how love requires totality. So if I want to give all of me, then I need to be in complete possession of myself. Um, and that's why other virtues like modesty and purity, they can help me to live out fully the virtue of chastity. Um, exteriorly, modesty can help me know how to dress. So I'll be careful about the clothes that I choose to, to wear. It helps me know how to behave with certain people, especially people of the opposite sex, the way that I'm supposed to um, you know, act, uh, the things I should say. Um, it'll help me know what kind of gestures, what things are appropriate, what things are not appropriate, even my postures, the way that I carry myself. Modesty is going to help me understand that if my body is truly a temple of, of the Holy Spirit and the person in front of me, their body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, then there needs to be a, um, a certain way that we treat each other, right? And so that goes much deeper too, interiorly. Like for purity, to live out purity, it means changing also the way that I see the other person, the way I look at them, and the way that I think about them. Right? So all of that reality of knowing that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit is going to be helped when I can learn to live out these virtues, um, which requires effort. Virtue is never easy to live. It's a, it's a very hard thing to do, but it was worth it, right? Um, and then I can be asking myself, you know, an important question. Does the way that I look at this person or the way that I dress or the way that I'm thinking of the other person, does that reflect the truth that I am a temple of God? Am I showing with my body exteriorly? that I believe that I am a temple of God and that that person in front of me is a temple of God. Because if God dwells in me, in my body, to misuse my body is to desecrate that temple and that dwelling place of God. And so it's gonna affect everything, the way that I live every day and the way that I treat the people that are with me. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's a beautiful expression, actually. I suppose if we give ourselves time to actually even reflect on it, that our body is a temple of God, because mm -hmm. so often, you know, in, in our culture and society, we, we don't really see it that way or maybe even valued enough in that sense, the spiritual dimension and the value of our soul before God is infinite. So, mm -hmm. you know, letting that truth seep in is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, so sisters to um, conclude or summarize have you some final words for us yeah, I think probably I'd just like to encourage um, the young people that are watching these these videos um, to really start to ask our Lord um, what their vocation is mm -hmm. if they haven't already started asking him um, because to discover your vocation is to discover the purpose of your life um, it, and ultimately, of course, as we've said tonight, the purpose of your life is to, to know how to love. Um, so whatever path that God is calling you to, um, it's going to be the one that's going to help you get to heaven, first of all. That's the most important thing. But it's also the path that's going to help you to be happiest in this life. Mm -hmm. um, but to re always remember, no matter what my vocation is, I'm only going to find the fulfillment of it when I learn how to give of myself. Um, that that has to be the, the center, the goal of my life. Mm -hmm. How does God want to, me to give myself? Mm -hmm. um, and then to just throw myself full force into whatever that vocation is, mm -hmm. um, to find fulfillment, but also uh, to help all the people that God is going to send into my life to also get to heaven. Mm -hmm. Because whoever your future spouse is or whoever the souls are that God's going to put on your path, they're the souls that he's entrusting to you. Um, so your vocation is more than just you yourself. Yeah. It's about all the souls that God is going to put on your path as well. So just be open and to pray to God, to, to, to the Holy Spirit, to enlighten you and to show you what your vocation in life is. Mm -hmm.
That's very beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Mary and Sister Rachel as well. Uh, very beautiful. So maybe it would be nice to conclude this video with a prayer and just to remember all our students in prayer that are partaking in the project and their families and of course anyone that will watch this video. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we entrust to you the fruits of this teaching video. We ask you to bless each of the young people that are watching it. We ask you to enlighten their minds, to open their hearts, to give them the courage to live the virtues of chastity, of modesty, of purity, and to be open to your will for them in their lives. We also entrust you all of the souls that have asked for our prayers, especially those who are in most need of our prayers right now. And in a particular way, we entrust ourselves to St. Joseph, foster father of Jesus, spouse of the Virgin Mary, head of the Holy Family, so that all, holy, all families may be as holy as the Holy Family. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, and, and now, now, and ever shall be. And ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Spirit. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>